going to leave the stage now so that she can come and share her thoughts on the intersection of the theme now and creativity. Please help me welcome Kate Winkler Dawson. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. I will say this is my third live event, third in-person event in two years. First one was for about 15 people. And the second one was for 3,000 people at CrimeCon in Las Vegas. <laughs> so this is a, I, this might actually be my favorite <laughs> size at this point. <laughs> it's a big difference. Uh, so, you know, we're, Ben was saying we're talking about now and, and um, creativity. And normally when I talk about projects, people want to know how I found these books, um, how I figured out the podcast and all that. And I think for your group, it might be a little bit more interesting for me to talk about a dirty word in my kind of realm and what people think are hoity-toity historians, which is branding. And I actually have been steering away from branding that word for a long time, but now I'm really embracing it. And I think it's because, um, you know, I had put myself into different categories my whole life. You know, I was a journalist. I grew up here. I'm a native Austinite. Let me check my time. Ben, I have 20 minutes, right? I just want to make sure I'm... I'm, I, made a, I make a deadline every time, so we'll be good. <laughs> and then we're taking questions. So, um, you know, I grew up here in Austin. For anybody who's here in Austin, I went to DOS, which is where my kids go, where they just got out of. And um, I went to Keeling, and then I went to what's now known as Lasso. And then I left, and I always say I spent about 18 years trying to get out of the city because I wanted to get away from my parents, and then the rest of the time trying to get back here. Uh, my dad was a law professor here at the University of Texas for 37 years. So if anybody took law school up until 2005 when he died, you probably had my dad. And so I, my roots are really in Austin, and I always thought I, I was going to come back here. And I started in journalism when I was 15 at KV24 and just sort of took off from there. And so for most of my adult life, uh, until my dad died, I thought I was going to be a journalist. I thought I was going to run CBS News eventually. I was at CBS and I was at ABC and you know I was really like rising in the ranks. I was a freelancer so I was you know all over the place and I enjoyed what I was doing and and when I came back to Austin because my dad passed away and I, I just wanted to be here with my family and I knew I wanted to meet someone and raise a family here. I came back here and I started teaching journalism and I was teaching students how to write in, in broadcast sentences that were like five to six words long. And it didn't feel very satisfying and I wanted to get into documentaries and so I started doing documentaries and as Ben mentioned, I teach now, I'm not in broadcast journalism at UT anymore, I teach um, documentary filmmaking within journalism. So the New York Times stuff you'd see or the New Yorker, those videos that are now nominated for Oscars, that's the, the format that I teach students. And so I'm teaching and I'm having a great time, but I still have this need for a creative outlet. And when I had my kids, I realized that documentary filmmaking was not going to work for me. I just couldn't drop everything and spend two years on a project. I needed to be able to work. I'm a morning person, like a really early morning person, like three or four in the morning. So I needed to be able to work during that time period. And a buddy of mine who's an author said, why don't you consider writing books? But all the writing I had done was five or six word sentences, and those are not books. I don't use commas. We don't believe in compound sentences in broadcast <laughs> journalism. So, so I thought there's no way. And he said, you know, you are a storyteller, and writing's writing, and you enjoy research. And so I started going down all these paths, and I promise this is going towards creativity. Because it's, it's really figuring out what your, what your thing is, what you're most passionate about. And I started going down all these paths. I got an agent who liked my writing. And um, so I started thinking, okay, well, what am I interested in? And my agent was really into historical wars. And I like the Civil War. I love the Revolutionary War time period. And so, um, and in the 1800s. And so I said, well, okay, I'll just do stuff on wars. And I ended up doing five book proposals. Anybody's ever done a nonfiction book proposal? They're like 40 to 50 pages long. And I ended up essentially writing an entire book's worth of book proposals and kept getting no's. No, 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 no. And a friend of mine said, finally, when I was so frustrated, she said, you spend, when you're done researching and you're writing and you're dragging yourself through these proposals, 
what do you do? Like, what are you watching on TV? And it's always, I call them death shows. So like 48 Hour Mysteries, Dateline NBC. So I knew all of the contemporary stuff. I didn't know a lot of historical crime, but I knew all the contemporary stuff. And she said, why don't you just write about that? And this was, I, people like to say the boom of true crime. True crime has been big forever. There's no boom. Penny Dreadfuls, I mean, I, I'm getting ready to um, close on a book that was from really the first person to ever write about advocacy and true crime, which was from 1841. So true crime has been around forever. People have always been passionate. People have gone to public hangings. I mean, this, is, this was you would picnic and take your children to a public hanging <laughs> until, until the 1800s, until the mid-1800s. So, you know, this, is always, this has always been a big part of the way that people shine a light on parts of society that, you know, perhaps we haven't been able to tap into yet. And I, am, um, I have a lot of interest in crime just because I love um, how to tell a story in sort of a narrative arc. And I teach my students this. You guys would know, like Harry Potter, you start out, how do you, bring your, how do you pull an audience into Harry Potter? He's living under the staircase, he's an orphan, he's abused, automatically you're feeling, you're pulled into this character. And then he starts you know, going up the arc, he starts encountering different problems, and there's big challenges, there's a climax, you know, uh, with the, what is it, the man we should not name, or the, the name we do not speak. <laughs> and, then, and then there's the aftermath. So somebody has inevitably changed in that story, right? Somebody has shifted, and, and true crime, and I also teach a sports class with a buddy of mine who's a fantastic sports reporter. We, see, we teach sports documentaries, and it's the same way. I mean, somebody, you've got two rivals, and they play each other, and somebody loses, and somebody wins, and you set the stakes early. These kids need, need these to get into college. Whoever wins is going to get into the best college, and, and then all of a sudden, I could give a fig about basketball, and all of a sudden, I'm watching a film, and, and I think crime is the same way, and that's why I've always been really interested in it. Um, I also happen to be somebody who's been lucky enough to not have been thrown into that world because I've had a family member who's been killed or you know, somebody who has been involved in it as a perpetrator. So I think that I come to it at a little bit more of a distance. So when I got into this, you know, I, I said, well, okay, I'm gonna write about historical true crime. And that has worked out really well for me. But I've always thought of myself first as a journalist and then I said, okay, well, I'm gonna shift it and I'm still doing writing. And then I'm shifting to documentary filmmaking. Well, that's not working. I'm shifting to being a, a professor. That's going well, but I still want to be really creative because I love documentaries, but they're not working. And then I go to books, which I can write at 3 in the morning. And that's going well, but I will tell you this. this, was, uh, this was a, there were two pivotal things that moved me over to podcasts because I had never listened to a podcast ever. I'm a reader. I don't like to listen to things. For somebody who taught broadcast journalism, I don't like watching <laughs> stories. I like to read them. And um, so I was, two things happened. One was um, I had uh, my first book, which was Death in the Air, which is about the Great London Smog of 1952 that killed 12,000 people and was covered up by the government. And there's a, a bunch of people, real life people who were there, uh, including a serial killer. And so when I wrote that book, it did pretty well. It was in the middle of a lot of Trump stuff and, you know, a lot of Trump books trumped, you know, the, the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list. So it did pretty well. The, after the book released, though, the New York Times book review picked, like, three books that you should buy as an as audience. All of you should buy this book right before Christmas, um, and my book was one of them, the paperback version, which is huge for any author. The, you know, the New York Times book review is the creme la creme. These are all the people who are reading books. It goes up, it's published everywhere, and I look at my numbers after Christmas, and I netted 500 extra copies, which is crap. I mean, for Christmas, it's not, not good. And then at the same time, I think within about a month, I was watching 48 Hours Mysteries, and I'm gonna be, try to be really tactful when I say this. I was watching 48 Hours, and there was a, a man, a podcaster on there, who I'd never really heard of, but then again, I had never really listened to podcasts anyway. And there's this guy, and you know, he's wearing kind of a frumpy t-shirt, and he's in sort of a makeshift studio, and he's talking about his podcast. And he says, my grandmother was murdered along with her best friend 40 years ago, and he was sort of reinvestigating it, right? Perfectly nice guy, I'm sure. No journalism background, no writing background, no even PR background, like no investigative background. This guy, just this guy, average, this average guy, just is like, I'm gonna do a podcast. <laughs> no, listen to this, average, average dude, 
300,000 subscribers. And I just went, oh my God, I mean, this is what I need to do. It was a big experiment. Don't tell anybody this. It was a huge experiment. <laughs> is this going to make me sell more books, right? Is this going to help my, my book career? And so that's how it started is because that's my audience. These are the people who are listening because the New York Times book review is great because you've got all these people who want to read books, but a small percentage or maybe a small percentage only want to read true crime, right? Now, somebody who's listening to one of my podcasts, like, you know, five or 10 of you guys, you like true crime. And a lot of my listeners are, are really good readers. So when the experiment started, it was, um, you know, I have a background in radio and, um, I know how to gather my own stuff. I don't have a career that goes along with me for, for the show Tenfold More Wicked, which is like a documentary series. So I pick one historical true crime, and I go and I talk to the descendants, the family members. Some of the seasons are contemporary enough where the people are still alive, but they're several generations back, but they've known the victims, or it's been a big part of their history. Some of them barely know anything about it, but then they start researching it when I talk to them. I go to the places where these things happened. I have a great composer who writes custom music that's very much in the time period. Um, and so, you know, it's really supposed to be an immersive experience. And then we talk about the issues, which is what happens with my books. This is why you should care today. That people care about wrongful conviction, which was American Sherlock. People care about why we study the criminal mind now, which is my new book, All That Is Wicked. So, you know, people care about all of these stories. And what it made me realize was that um, you know, I, I, what I, I have these ideas, like the first two seasons of Tenfold More Wicked were failed book ideas. I had all the research, and it's, this is my genre, I was really phoning in on true crime being my thing. And so I had all this material already, so why not turn these into podcasts? And so the first two seasons went up, it turned into be a pretty big deal. I had another show called Wicked Words, which is just going to start in a couple of weeks, because all my buddies are true crime writers. And Penguin, my uh, publisher, started sending me around for the second book. They were sending me all over the place. And I got bored. I just, you know, I'm sitting in a hotel in Scottsdale. I don't know anybody. And so I just started calling local reporters. It was really weird because it's like all these men are showing up at my hotel room and we're just sitting down <laughs> and, I, and having, I know everybody, I would not have done it if I were them and it probably was not a smart idea for me to do it. But I just called the dude from the Phoenix Magazine and said, you did a great story about this FBI agent who was killed and dumped in a canal in Phoenix in 1920. Why don't you come to my hotel and let's talk about it? And luckily he did. And so I ended up with some really great journalists along the way and it turned into this other show. So a friend of mine said, I was, I'm, and continue to go crazy with projects, and um, I also am a mom, and I've got two kids, and I'm a wife, and so I juggle all this stuff all the time. And a, and a buddy of mine, who's one of my producers, said, at one point, he could tell I was really just frustrated, probably about a year ago, just with balancing everything, and he said, why don't you just be good at one thing? <laughs> like, pick, be the best author ever. The best, like, blow Eric Larson out of the water. Just be the best author or be the, or be the best podcaster. Why do you have to do all of this? And I said, because I am really a storyteller. I'm not an author. I'm not a podcaster. Both of my books have been optioned for TV series. I'm working on both of those series. Like, I, you know, there's my, my reach is, is now pretty wide, and it's because I'm not siloing myself. Because I finally realized that, you know, I can, I can have a great story. I can get this guy comes to me and says, I've got this great story in my family. What do you think? And I will immediately start categorizing it. Is this going to be a book because it's a really big, heavy subject that I can write 90,000 words about and Penguin will go crazy for it? Because it's something that speaks to us today or it was history making. Is this story better for Tenfold More Wicked? Because I could just hear all the sounds and it's in a location where I drag my family from place to place, unfortunately for them sometimes. <laughs> so we went to Virginia for 10 days and they had a great time, but I went from place to place to record some shows in Virginia. Um, I just started doing, uh, Penguin's never done this, but I talked my editor inexplicably into just doing an audiobook exclusive. So I'm not even writing the book, I'm just, writing 30,000 words that will never be printed, and I'm delivering it because my audience is primarily an, an audiobook audience at this point. So I'm immediately thinking, okay, well, where does his family story fit in into the kind of storytelling I'm doing? And I have a lot of envy from friends of mine who are authors or only podcasters because they don't have that. They don't have that 
they, they're too scared to go into something or they don't have the right resources. And I think part of it was lucky for me that I had these different skills. I can go out and gather my own audio. I have a go, my, my friend calls it a go kit. And it's just like my backpack. It's got all my audio equipment in it. So when we go to London next week, I'm, I'm taping a story in London. And you know, I, can, I know how to set it up so the audio sounds good. But I, a lot of it is training. So for me, it was recognizing, I think, a couple of things. One, it was recognizing who my audience is. So when it was time to sell this podcast, my, um, there are, believe it or not, podcast agents. That's their whole job is to sell podcasts because it's become so big. My podcast agent was with um, UTA. And he came to me and he said, OK, I've got some different options. And he, let me describe who they are. And it was like iHeartRadio and a couple of different places. But here's this other network. They're called Exactly Right. <laughs> there you go, right on, Murderinos. It's called Exactly Right. And, it, and I had never, I had sort of like, you, you know, you're kind of in a bucket if you haven't heard of my favorite murder because it's always like the big, big, the big true crime. If you know anything about true crime, it's the, the biggest true crime essentially for years. And it's a com, you know, kind of a comedy show where the women talk about mental health, but they, but they also talk about true crime. And they said, these two women, it's a young network. They only have a few shows. You'll get a lot of attention. It's women, you know, female-centric, and their audience is, you know, 80% women. And of course, they're true crime because they're committed to listening to Karen and Georgia talk about true crime. And my agent said, this is them. This is the audience. They will buy your book. I mean, Karen and Georgia could say this napkin is a fantastic napkin, and they'll put like a My Favorite Murder stamp, and the and they'll the women will buy it, and then they will like create a nonprofit for napkins that have gone <laughs> gone missing. And, and people will donate a lot of money. So it's a very powerful advocacy show. It is not just a let's talk about death and destruction show. It's kind of like My Favorite Murder is kind of a movement, and I wanted to be involved with that. But just aside the fact from I love being involved with all women, you know, I have like my dog's a, a female, like I have two girls. <laughs> like I just, I think it's, I, there's something really interesting about that. And so, um, I have figured out that this audience is kind of incredible. The feedback I get from the people I have, like you know, moms, really high, highly educated people. I have people who are in high school who are just still trying to figure out. I have very high-end sex workers who email me and correct me if I say something wrong. I mean, I just get like all kinds of feedback, and I love all of it. So it's been. Let me check my time. So it's been. Finding that audience has been really important to me to a point where the next book that I'm doing is, for the first time, my main characters are, it, are me and a true crime writer from 1841. And we are investigating a case of a woman who was, was or was not murdered by her lover who was a Methodist minister in the 1800s, and it was a huge scandal. And so it's a, that book is, one of the subtitles is A Reckoning for True Crime which is the way we treat victims and families a lot of times in true crime, which is as a prop in storytelling. It is not you know, as centric because in, you know, I think people find serial killers and you know, murderers to be so much more interesting than the victims. And I, and I don't find that to be true. So in my books, particularly because I write a lot about men killing women, I work really hard to make the women stand up to the men as much as I can. I, I look for really strong you know, characters in a nonfiction book, which is sort of interesting. So all of this is, to me, uh, it comes down to a tale of how do I figure out who I am as a journalist, as a writer, just like you would as like a mom or a wife or, or whatever you're doing, a husband, um, figuring out you know, who you are, what you want to give back. Because I just realized this is a legacy. I mean, I could say something totally stupid on Tenfold More Wicked. And it will never go away. It will never go away. It's always there. So I have to be really careful. Um, and I think about that a lot, like my responsibility. And I think a lot of times in true crime, people don't think about before they say things. They don't think about what their responsibility is. And so that is a, is a big goal. I'm trying to, ele I hope to elevate true crime to a point where I feel like it's, it's um, past the point of we are just talking about how brilliant Ted Bundy was, you know? I mean, I, it kind of grosses me out when we think about stuff like that. I, I would really rather talk about the ramifications of, you know, what that means. So, um, you know, I think, uh, do you want to, at this point, Ben, take questions? 
or we still have a few more minutes because I'm a talker. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're going to take questions, let's give Kate a round of applause for this person. Thank you. I thought of one while you were talking. Oh, so great. I'm going to take the first one if I could. <laughs> when talking or thinking about true crime, um, it's not like suicide where we have to avoid the subjects uh, in order to not incite it. Right. There are copycat murderers. We see that in what happened in Buffalo. The manifesto was duplicated from others. Right. Um, how do you think about or parse the uh, implications of heroizing or bringing these stories back to public eyes? Um, how do you mitigate that? Do you think about it at all? Yeah, I mean, I think about that all the time. I think glorifying killers is gross. And I've had a couple of interviews that I've done with writers where they just are so effusive about the killer. I think because maybe they think it'll sell the books because they want those details that nobody has ever given. Um, so I will say this. I, in my books, and in, in any kind of nonfiction project, I prefer to work with dead people. I don't like working with live people. And, I'm, and I mean that in that I am uncomfortable with doing stories on the Menendez brothers or a Ted Bundy. I'll give you an example because it just makes, it makes me uncomfortable. I have um, a buddy who works at UT and they have a podcast there, which I like a lot. And they did a story on the Colton Petoniak murders, which just happened at UT. Just, I think I was here 15 years ago teaching, maybe 20 years ago, where it was a man who um, was convicted of killing his friend or girlfriend and dismembering her body. And there was a friend of his involved with the cover up, right? So they do the story, they create a Facebook page and both families join that page at the same time. Uh -huh. So the victim's family and Colton Petoniak's family mm -hmm. both got on. <laughs> I was like, what a nightmare, Robert. I mean, no, I would never do that. I couldn't, I couldn't do it because I, and then it, there was a lot of tension and a lot of bad feelings. I feel like for me, my preference is always, you know, to, to have some space while still bringing the passion to it. So I, I think I get, a, I get out of some of the, what I feel like is really mucky about the contemporary crime stuff. Gabby Petito would be a really good example of that. I mean, that story really it was difficult in the latest, uh, in, when I was in Crime Con, I did an interview with a man named um, David Robinson, who his son is, um, his name is Daniel Robinson. He was a geologist and he went missing. And it was a big story in Rolling Stone because Daniel Robinson was a person of color who went missing around the same time as Gabby Petito. And in, I mean, how many of you have heard of David Rob, uh, Daniel Robinson? Not many. And so that, that I did an interview with, with David about that. And I've also interviewed the Black and Missing, the Women with Black and Missing Foundation. And I think that that has been more my focus than anything is really working on stories that people haven't heard of before that we're not, I feel like we're not exploiting the, vid the victims. If anything, we're bringing them to the forefront. That's the goal for me. So, mm. um, you know, this, a lot of the seasons, it's a challenge though, because I work a lot in the 1800s. And frankly, you know, anyone, women especially, but and also with um, women of color, boy, they were unreported. Any cases were unreported, unless it was just freakish and a huge story. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think part of it is trying to keep a distance from the killer, trying not to go on and on about how brilliant. It just grosses me out when people are like, oh my God, this is Israel Keys is the most brilliant person ever and you won't believe what he did next and how can you, can you even imagine that somebody could pull this off? And mm. I just, uh, it skews mm. me out, so. I see a question back here. Okay, so um, I, your book about London and, and that serial killer and, and everything that happened there I thought was so fascinating because you tied it to this larger thing that was happening in the city, which if in, nobody knows this story, but it was like about the smog that was happening in London and how that was killing so many people and that, that was actually the greater issue, but there was, this, there was all these other things that were allowed to happen within that because it was kind of hidden. And so, and you really tied it to things that are still happening now and things that we're overlooking and how we're not learning from sort of these like historical things. Is there anything else happening now that you've already kind of like identified some past trends or past uh, true crimes to that you're interested in next? It's so interesting because it really, you just see over and over again that people making the same mistakes and you know, I mean, in the smog, if you look at the cover of my book, it's this woman, this very Jackie Onassis looking woman 
with a, with a scarf over her face because they thought that that would stop pollution, which it didn't really. And the government not doing a good job, you know, getting word out, trying to kind of cover it up. And there are a lot of things I think that we can see now. Um, the second book was, you know, American Sherlock, which is about bad forensics, which of course we struggle with now, bite mark evidence. And, you know, I, I, forensics is so interesting to me because that's how they caught Bundy was a bite mark, but it's completely inaccurate. I mean, you, you, it's junk science. So, <laughs> you know, I could go on and on about how, how junk science has caught some people that we know were killers, but really legally they shouldn't have. So I think that book took place in the 1920s, and we're still seeing all of that happen now. The book in the 1920s, though, was the beginning of all of this fingerprinting and really the, the start of forensics. And the, you know, the book that I'm doing, um, the, the book that I'm doing that comes out in October, which is based on the first season of my podcast, is about this psychopath for sure killer who killed his wife and his child and his niece and his sister-in-law and then at least one or two other people but he was a genius and nobody wanted to to have him executed except for the families because they said he's too smart to execute let's just put him somewhere in a you know locked room and let him do his work and so i think all of these are things that we can, you know what do we value in society what do we value and do we value victims' lives over you know, the perpetrator and what they might be able to contribute? Because people can compartmentalize. I mean, that's what they do. You, know, you have a perfectly nice person who seems like you know, they're, a, they're a, a, a positive contributor to society and a good parent, and then they turn into to something else. So I think there's a lot of that, like what I talked about with my book, the with historical true crime with, um, with um, um, the history of how we exploit victims, not just women, but victims throughout history. So I think the more you look at history, the more you kind of go, wow, this is, this is something that um, you know, just keeps repeating over and over again. And, and I don't know if we learn from it at all. Mm. It's just interesting to continually bring it up. Mm. You know? All right. Oh. Two more. How do you keep your spirits up? You're, you seem really well adjusted. And I love watching true crime, but then I need to take a break and watch like a month of comedies. You know, I was just having a discussion with my daughter, who's 12 and a half, and she's a big kind of spooky true crime. She wrote this great story about when she was like 10 about um, she was it was a fiction story and it's about a woman and she's looking through a window and there's a known serial killer who's stalking everybody and she sees a serial killer through the window and then she realizes it's the reflection and he's standing right next to her. That's a 10 year old who's coming up with stories like this. So I, I'm either doing something really right or really wrong. I'm not sure, we're just gonna have to wait and see which way she goes. But I was talking to her the other day and I'll tell you this is a funny, it's a funny impact on me. Halloween has always been my favorite holiday. Forever, forever, I love, if I could have a gas lamp in every room in my house and it weren't like a t horrific fire hazard, I would do it. <laughs> that being said, it is now not my favorite holiday. I would say I'd have to go for Christmas or the winter breaks because, and, I, and my daughter was asking me that the other day. She said, why do you think that is? And I said, I think I just, I just deal with this creepy weird stuff all the time that I think I must just need Santa or something. I don't know, <laughs> something to lighten the mood a little bit. So, but I don't, um, I will say things, sexual assaults really bother me. Um, the murders of children really, really bother me. I, there are certain things that, like somebody pitched me a story uh, for the podcast and it was about a woman who murdered like something like 20 children, like babies. Oh. Just in case any of you are gonna email me with a story idea, not something I'm gonna do. I just, <laughs> it totally, it totally freaks me out. Bring me a good female killer. I like, I try to do one of those every, every year. Somebody, you know, it's a refreshing change. Um, and I, and I really, and I, and I, but there, there are certain things that I, I'm really uncomfortable with. The book that the woman in the back mentioned, Death in the Air, there's the death of a little girl in it. And that, that really bothered me. This, the bigger story was so much more important than I just sort of dealt with it. But there are certain things that really, that really bug me. But I just try to 
steer clear of those as much as I can. I still watch Dateline NBC and all those death shows though, <laughs> in my breaks. <laughs> but real quick, because you mentioned Christmas is like one of your reprieves. Is there a daily reprieve? Because you, you're not waiting a whole year to get your like, <laughs> your job. Then, like <laughs> is there something more daily that lifts your spirits? No, I will say about Christmas, we keep our tree up for two months. I think <laughs> because of there that. Go, so maybe I guess. think because of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that I my kids are great and we um, I exercise always really helps me like lifting weights and stuff helps me and I have I, my mom is a massive true crime fan I mean she talks about she's the one who told me about small town dicks I had never heard of that podcast and we ended up doing a it's a good <laughs> podcast it's not dirty and we ended up doing a uh, promo I kind of want it to be dirty though <laughs> I, no listen, listen the host is um, the voice of Lisa Simpson on the Simpsons oh, amazing. we did a promo swap and I was like god this is my dream to hear Lisa Simpson talk about how great my show is <laughs> promo swap is the best the best thing ever that's happened to me. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's hard. But I can block this stuff out because, again, it's not something that's been part of my life. It would mm. really bug me to do some of these really present stories. Um, it does start to get me a little bit sad when I read. It's, it's particularly with the with the podcast and with books too. When I get to read the words of what the victim said before they died, that really mm. bothers me. But mm. I. You just have to think like, what is the bigger purpose? Because I think what I do is important. I know people think true crime, it's gross. And you know, I, I really feel like we can learn a lot of, of, from it. So I, it's my job is to bring it to you in a way where it doesn't feel sleazy, where it feels <laughs> like, you know, my, my agent calls it a lot of medicine with some honey just coating over it, where yeah. you kind of go, whoa, I didn't intend to think about, uh, I didn't intend to learn about like organ donation and body snatchers and, you know, <laughs> from an 1823 story, but mm. I don't know. All right, we're going to do one more. Uh, and then, so you've got a choice. Well, Marty's <laughs> made the choice. Um, I was just going to ask about the, so what you brought up about Colton, that was the Orange Street yeah. podcast, right? So did you listen to, or how do you feel about the Austin bombings since that was more present day and um, no. they, yeah, that was like the second season of that podcast. You know, I didn't, and I know that story, of course, if you're in Austin, you remember the, the guy who, you know, and then I think he blew himself up, right? Yeah. So, he, I didn't end up, I didn't end up listening to that season at all. Okay. Well, yeah, what I thought was interesting is, um, I actually, that's the only like murder podcast I've ever listened to, oh. um, but they really talked about like the privacy of not discussing like his letter before he did kill himself like they had that and legally they couldn't read it in the yeah. podcast so it just gave me like the heebie-jeebies because like orange tree i pass that condo all the time yeah and then um the austin bombing like all those neighborhoods they mentioned were yeah. so close to like everyone here so i don't know if you just had thoughts on that i just it's too difficult for me i can't yeah. i can't i i really the somebody pitched me something from the 1970s and that seems to Recent. It's also yeah. a challenge to get people to connect to someone who lived 160 years ago. I think mm. one of the things that's interesting is obviously people in the Austin bombing and the Petoniac story, everybody's still alive. They know all the details. And so, you know, I'll approach, like, I, I wanted to do the story that actually is going to air next year. I can't really talk about it, but it's an Austin based story from the 1800s. And it's not the Midnight Assassin, okay. Servant Girl <laughs> Annihilator story. So, um, it's a story, and um, I found a relative who, you know, it was the, the killer's great, great, great niece. And I found her, and I emailed her, and I said, I want to talk about your great, great uncle. And she said, great. I've been waiting for somebody to talk to me about this. And I called her, and I told her kind of quickly, yeah, this is what I found, and this is what he did, and all this. And she said, that is not why I thought you were calling me. <laughs> she said, my, one of my other uncles had a shootout with Bonnie and Clyde. And that's <laughs> and she's like, you're calling me about a family annihilator. And oh, wow. uh, so, you know, I, I think, and, and then on the other hand, I, the season that uh, was kind of sandwiched in the middle of the two seasons we have right now, was from the 1860s. And it's a family feud in Virginia that ends up with three family members on one side dead 
um, all over a custody battle over a little girl. In, and they end up killing them in the divorce proceedings in court during the divorce proceedings. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> these two families know versus, you know versus other family members in other stories, they don't know anything about it because it's been covered up. And like Burke and Hare, who were serial killers in Scotland in the 1800s, we found their um, great, his uh, great, great like niece and nephew. They knew everything about the family until uh, one of the killer's nieces. And then it stopped at the niece. They didn't know anything about anyone else. Clearly, because this was such an infamous case, that the families in the 1800s just said, we're not going to talk about this. This is mm. something that's buried. Versus this family feud, they still had the knife that, <laughs> that gutted one of these people. I mean, it was really, it was, wow. th this is, and I had a family reunion with these two families together, and we had like <laughs> pasta, and they talked, <laughs> and they talked, it was great, and they talked all about the family and, and the family history. They knew everything about something that happened 160 years ago versus other families that, of things that happened in like 1920, 1930, and they don't know anything about. So it's just so interesting the way you know, the, like when a big event like that, like the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the way that it's portrayed in generations says a lot about your family, what you don't, what you know and you don't know. I will say this one last thing. So this season coming up, that's going to be like next January, is about a, um, a serial poisoner from New Orleans. It's such a good story. It's all these people dead in a family in a very short period of time. And the poisoner, you find out really quickly, ends up not getting convicted, right? So she goes and she moves in with her nephew eventually. And she's in her 70s and 80s at this point. She moves in with her nephew and his wife. So the nephew, you know, fast forward 30, uh, 30 or 40 years later, he dies. The wife, is, whose name is Cecile, is here, you know, and she's 90 years old. And I interview her and she said, I just heard this story six months ago. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, he never told me I was living with a serial poisoner for two years. <laughs> she said, this man's been dead for like 40 years, and he, no one in the family ever talked about her past. I always wondered why we didn't go back to New Orleans, and nobody <laughs> knows anything about this story. So it was just horrifying, like what people cover up. So, you know, go do your ancestry and check out, and, and then <laughs> email me. It's in, info at templemorewicked.com. So. <laughs> I was going to say, this makes me feel really good about my family right now. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> if I could yeah. find a good serial killer, I mean, I have Confederates, and that's about it. So if I could find a good like, serial killer, I would be so happy in my family. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen, I don't know if you were looking up when you said this, but a lot of eyes got really wide and excited when you said serial poisoner. Mm. Like, just suddenly, like, the idea of a poisoner was like, ooh. <laughs> Well, I did not know, I started doing, I'm, I'm sure some of you guys know this, but you know, you could buy morphine in magazines. They had morphine laced cough lozenges for little kids. Cocaine, of course, Coke had cocaine in it back in that time period. I mean, it was really, like you could get anything you wanted very easily. So the whole poisoning aspect of it's pretty Well, could it do next day, like Amazon? Like, <laughs> you could go. You could go to your local chemist and yeah, get it immediately. Yeah. They just grind it for you right there. Yeah, here you go. Here you go. Here's your morphine. All right. All right. Well, let's uh, give one more big round of applause for Kate. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.